everyone. I've no doubt that the experience is um, more reassuring for those that are smarter than I am. Uh, but the more time I spend preaching, the more experiences I've had preaching, the uh, more time I spend in study just trying to weed out what I haven't learned yet from the few things that I actually think I know. Um, and there was a little bit of that going on with what I've prepared today in particular. What I had started with, or the reason I started with this, um, ended up getting lost in what I ended up with was I, when I concluded. So I actually sort of have two lessons today, and the first one I'll address fairly quickly. We're going to be looking at the cleansing of the temple from uh, John 2, <coughs> and then also uh, from Matthew 21, which, shame on me, I had never caught on that these were uh, different, different occurrences. That, that Jesus cleansed the temple more than once. Uh, I'm going to read these two accounts quickly, and then we'll continue. John 2, beginning in verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold the doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered what is written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And if you turn back to Matthew for kind of another instance where this occurs. Matthew 21, beginning in verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did, and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, Yes. Have you never read, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? I was curious to read these again recently, when I bumped in the same week into two different people on Facebook that said the following, near as exact as the quote as I could pull back up. First one was, even Jesus upset the table sometimes. And the other one was, you are just upset because I'm willing to cleanse the temple, indicating that the conversation was not going well. Right? And it's not the first time I've seen it um, online or anyone else, anywhere else, but the idea is essentially that there's a, um, to put it kindly, a difficult conversation taking place and two people are at conflict, and this is brought up. In these two particular instances, as in other instances I've seen, the person who said this was not exhibiting kind behavior at all. At all. And so when I started looking at this again, I thought, you know what, I've, I've seen this a lot. Let's go back and see how this can be used to justify. And so the, the first point I'd like to ultimately end up making, not to be missed, is, is you can't use Jesus' behavior here to justify angry attitudes towards brethren. You can't. Um, but writing a whole sermon about what this, uh, what these, this section of scripture doesn't say, you know, so, so as, as I went on, I you know, got some other things out of it. So actually, yes, yes, I'll touch on this again, but generally let's, let's look at this and see what perhaps we could learn, what lessons are available for us from the cleansing of the temple in these two, two occasions. Let's look at the command that leads to the situation, some context for what's going on here in the temple. There's some ceremonial sacrifice. There's lots of ceremonial sacrifice that's discussed in Deuteronomy when the law is given. And this is kind of the context for what is taking place at the temple when Jesus comes to some extent. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place where he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booze. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God has given you. 
And so this is required of them. Eventually, the temple is established as the location for this to occur. And he makes an allowance for travel, because some come a long way. Deuteronomy 14 says, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, you shall turn it into money. So basically you, you don't bring the animal with you, you bring the, the money to purchase the animal so that you can perform your responsibilities there. And so this is the framework, and I, I don't really mean that way because they're not following the pattern by the time we get here, but the idea is, is that this is in the back of their heads somewhere, hopefully, maybe, um, when we reach the point that Jesus approaches the temple and finds it corrupted. So the corruption that we see taking place. Um, Jesus refers, it, refers to it as a den of robbers. If you turn to Luke 19, uh, what do I have up there? Luke 19.46. Yeah, this is this is the um, this is the account that Luke provides of of th these occasions. Verse forty six, saying to them, "My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves." We, we've got there again. That's it's a quote from Jeremiah seven. And if you look at Jeremiah seven, it's this discussion that God is happening, and we and the study that we had of Jeremiah. I can't remember how long ago it was. It wasn't that long ago. I feel like I remember it better than the distance of time it has been. I, it was a very encouraging study. Uh, Jeremiah 7.11 has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes. Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. So a couple things we can understand from this is that the corruption of the Lord's house is nothing new for them. They've been dealing with it at least since the time of Jeremiah, and certainly before. But the point that he's making is, look, you know, you, were, you as a nation were condemned for this in the past. And you're still doing this, so so there should be no surprise here. He, he compared them to a den of robbers, although we do not see it said necessarily that they are stealing. Jesus said, saw something that made him make this comparison here. So, something to consider here, this is from some uh, historian online. When Jews traveled to Jerusalem from other lands, they brought money for room, board, and souvenirs. Okay, well, hopefully for their sacrifice <laughs> too, right? Most importantly, they were required to pay the annual half shekel tribute to the temple. The currency they had would be of their native land or acquired in trade along the way, which, you know, what makes sense, life happens, right? Money changers performed a key service when they converted the varieties of local coin to the required tribute of silver shekels or half shekels of tire. The law stated, and I don't understand this exactly, because the law, the law did state that they were supposed to bring a half shekel. But time has gone on, currency changes, things are going on. But whatever, whatever it is, historians generally believe that the money changers required a specific, a specific shekel, okay, which is kind of beyond the, the, the purview of the requirement. Um, it was most likely mandated because they were of good silver and true weight at a time when many coins were debased or lightweight. So there's money changes there. Why are there money changes there? Because this is going on. But we understand from historians such as these and, and in other locations that they were charging for it which is something that they're not supposed to do, Jesus describes them as a den of robbers. Could it also be that the same sacrifice was substandard? It's happened before. If you look in Malachi, Malachi 1, verse 8. When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord? Jesus has clarified that they have a history of abusing the temple, and we know they have a history of abusing the sacrifice, and they've been identified as a den of robbers. Probably some old habits here are dying hard. That would be my suggestion. I don't want to emphasize that too much more because there's an extent to which there's some speculation here, but it is, you know, uh, historically uh, recorded. The point that I want to make at the moment, though, is that this is happening in the temple. And even if they are not robbing, and even if they are bringing in an acceptable sacrifice, there are things that are not supposed to happen in the temple. The temple is reserved for certain purposes and not for others. So regardless of what else they may or may not be doing incorrectly, they're doing it in the temple, and they're not supposed to. So Jesus corrects them with a whip of cords. Here's an example of a, of a scourge, as, as someone suggested. It's basically... A, it might have a handle, it might not, but it's got all the little knots in it that are made, and, and then you 
you you thrash the things or 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 at least encourage them in the direction to get them get them to move. So he drives out the sheep and oxen and he upsets the tables of the money changers. And now I start considering some of the lessons. Now this is brought up by the apostles. It says after these things, as these things were happening, he remem they remembered um, the scripture that says, uh, "Zeal for my house will consume me," and that's Psalm sixty nine. So let's let's just confirm that real quick. Psalm sixty nine and verse nine. Because you, for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that also became my reproach. I made my sackcloth. I made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gates speak against me, and I am uh, the song of the, the drunkard. This is a psalm of David, who's, who's pointing out that his fervor for for what is holy to God has made him an outcast to those around him. And this is exactly what ends up going on with Christ here, right? The people are upset with him because of what he's done when all he's doing is advocating the truth. So consider the fact here that, you know, prophecy, to the extent there's prophecy here, um, is kind of fulfilled. Zeal for my house will consume me. If if nothing else, God's nature and expectation is is illustrated in the psalm and it's illustrated in Christ's behavior here. And the point you can get from this is that nothing here should be a surprise. Okay? God's expectations for the temple were laid out. They were supposed to be obedient to that. There's poetic application in the psalm to what's happening here. If you want to turn to Jeremiah discusses the abuse of the temple. There, there's no new lesson to be had from this. None of this should be surprised. If you go back to Malachi again in, in chapter 3. Malachi 3 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord. For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, yet the days of your fathers you have yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinance, you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. But you said, In what way will we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? See, they're in denial. In tithes and offerings is how they have robbed him. From at least the time of Deuteronomy, when a law was established for them. We see, we see instances where the temple is profaned and corrupted in their behavior. Even if what they were doing might be okay outside the temple walls, what they're doing inside the temple is not okay. And they are condemned for that in Jeremiah, and they are condemned for that in Malachi. And it is illustrated in Psalm 69, and here we are in John and in Matthew seeing it happen twice, again. Again, my point being, this is not new. They should not be surprised. So the conflict. Those in the temple did not respond to the correction well at all. Uh, they knew what Jesus could do, and they challenged him. What sign do you show us? Well, they've gotten pretty used to seeing his signs of authority, apparently. And here they are. So Eric is like, what? You don't like what we're doing? Well, what are you going to do about it now? You know, show us something. Prove it to us. And this is remarkable because, my last point, they know by now. That, I mean, what sign do they show us? Now, Jesus' answer is very interesting. But his answer could have been Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Malachi... You know, his answer was <coughs> Jeremiah. And and when they do it a second time, I don't I don't get the impression that they stopped until Matthew twenty one, you know, but but he has to come back. They they are blind to the truth. This is one of the things about about the Pharisees that, that frightens me into into thinking I, I never want to be like that in this way. Is is their blindness 
because of their jealousy and their desire for power and their frustration with, with Jesus' um, grasp of the truth and the authority here. Back in Matthew 21, verse 15, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did in the temple, cry, and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And, and you, you have to be pretty far gone to take that attitude about these things happening in public. I mean, they're, they, they spend a life in pretense and, and falsehood, yet, yet the, the only moments where they reflect any honesty to the world around them, they're just ugly. They are ugly. You know, stop healing those people. Stop making those children happy. Who wants to come out and just say that? Somebody who's not paying attention. Somebody who's not paying attention to what's going on in front of them. If, if, this is their, if this is what they've got left, they've got nothing. Right? They are blind to the truth. They are indignant and jealous of Jesus' power. What an opportunity wasted here to accept the truth. Show us a sign. What sign will you show us? I'll, I'll raise up the temple, right? Well, they're not seeing that right then. But he, he, drives, he drives them out the second time and then is healing people. Well, there's a sign. And all they can do with that sign is be ugly, okay? Which shows Jesus' wisdom here. What sign do you show us? A sign's irrelevant to you. A sign means nothing to you people, right? By the time he was healing people, Matthew 21, I don't think he was doing it for the Pharisees' benefit. The application for us, the condition of our temple, and, and these are where some applications I think can be made. So we've, we've looked at this picture of how Jesus treats how, how Jesus' zeal for the temple. We've seen God's expectation for our behavior in the temple, the purpose that the temple is used for. And, and the illustration of, of the temple and how it applies to us today, it, it shows up throughout scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So the question is, if we are the temple, should whatever comes next be a surprise to us? We know how God views his temple, right? We understand when he creates a temple, how he wants it to be treated, right? Verse 15, 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Just like the temple was given to the nation of Israel, a temple is given to us. It is our body. You are not your own. Did the temple belong to them? No, it was God's temple. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Purpose. Purpose here. You've been given a temple. What are you supposed to do with it? Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Can we discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect? Yes, we can. We're supposed to take those things and present them in the temple. Could an Israelite look at the sheep and see whether it was first class or not? Right? This is, this is our equivalent. <clears throat> and so let's look at this again. Because when Jesus says, den of thieves and robbers, and this is not the way the temple is supposed to be used, he's reading Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Perhaps the scariest part of this is the I myself have seen it thing. You know, this is Jonah attempting to hide and not being successful. This is Adam and Eve attempting to hide and not being successful. These are the people in the temple hiding behind the wall, right? And, and God sees it. God knows. We cannot hide it from him. This is, this is our temple. Okay, side point. I'll get back to this in a minute. But just really quickly, eternal security. Um, once saved, always saved. How can you read this and come up with the idea that what we do in our bodies is no longer relevant? Right? 
Once God has secured your spirit, nothing nothing can can change that. Look, our bodies are supposed to serve a purpose, and if we corrupt that purpose, that God has presented to us for us, is that you, I, I just don't know how you can make that argument when you understand what your body is for. But that's for free. Let's look at the comparisons more. God's expectation for His temple has not changed. It was the same in David's time as it was in Jeremiah's time, as it was in Christ's. Time. It's still Christ's time, but when Christ was on earth, okay, it hasn't changed now. When God has a temple, he sets it aside for certain things. We're supposed to treat that respectfully. We're supposed to follow his authority when we are using that resource in the way that he wants it to be used, right? It has purpose, and it can be violated. Free, free will is an amazing thing. <laughs> um, and the fact that God, in his power, set up a system for us that allows us room to mess it up is interesting to me. It put, there's, there's, with, with freedom comes responsibility. With freedom comes responsibility. You can sit up here and say that all day long and not go wrong. With freedom comes responsibility. So if it can be, God set up this, this wonderful system, and we can mess it up. We can mess it up in our behavior. He has now made our bodies the temple. And even we, we can commit we can commit sin. We can do things that are wrong. Stealing is always stealing. But there are other things that we can do with our body that that can be wrong in our body, even if they are not in, inherently wrong, which is what 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about. Here's an activity, and this activity has a certain place in your life, but, but it might not, too. And if that's the case, even though it is not necessarily a sin, it can be illegal when it's in your temple. This is not something that has been granted to you. This is not permissible in this location, right? That's, that's kind of the idea there that 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about, and, and um, sexual sin. So... Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make make offerings to Baal and go after other gods you have not known and stand before me in this house? Because that was God's attitude toward the temple then. That was that was Christ's attitude towards the temple in, in Matthew and John and Luke. Okay? So we've we've seen illustrated how God treats the temple. So the question is, our bodies are our temple. How do we treat our bodies? And again, the the, the people in the temple could have known, should have known, had no excuse, certainly. But you you can consider him driving them out and them saying, well, you know, here we are just trying to facilitate temple worship. How disruptive are you to us, you know, helping this process out? I mean, we know they're in denial from the attitudes that, that they had when Jesus presented a sign or offered, offered an explanation. So think about the sort of excuses that they would make. Well, we're not, we're not stealing... There's nothing wrong with charging a little extra. You know, I mean, how are they going to portray this in such a way as to make it look like they're not doing the wrong thing? How do we do it? Do we steal? No. But can I misallocate my employer's resources, for example? Because I can, and my body wasn't made to do that. Can I covet another person's possessions? I can do that. I shouldn't do that. But I'm capable of messing up the system and abusing God's temple. And then coming in here and saying, everything's okay. Do I murder? No, I, I can't. To, off the top of my head, I can't think of anyone I've murdered. <laughs> Hopefully none of you can either. But we can hate, and we are told that hating is, is as murder. We can hold a grudge. We cannot forgive. Our body, our temple, wasn't given to us to treat it that way. I have not committed adultery. But lust is a problem. My mind can wander. I can think things are funny that I should not. Right? Whoever lusts has committed adultery in his heart. God didn't give us our temple to be treated that way. And if we know that much, think about the fact that we know how God treats a corrupt temple. We know what God's solution to that is. Can we swear falsely? Neglect commitments or bend the truth? You know, I love bend the truth because the word truth is in it. It's so much easier to say lie? <laughs> it's, it's hard to say lie. We, you know, there, there's, there, you know, most of us, well, I would have murdered. Uh, lying happens. We, 
it shouldn't. But though we don't think we would go this far, I have certainly lied. I don't believe that there's anybody who is not at one time or another. Well, I, I hope I hope those people are out there, and I would be encouraged to to know them. Make offerings to Baal and go after other gods. Now I have not cut open a goat and sacrificed it to a to a carved rock. Um, but can you devote your life to something else? You become a Christian, and 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 you are you are raised up a a, a new person living for Christ because Christ died for you. And there's a commitment made there. A devotion that's supposed to be consistent. Right? Can I be distracted by what's going on around us? This is, this is especially something that happens all the time. What might get in your way? Building a house all summer? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think about this. I've been thinking about this recently because this has consumed me to some extent. And we all have things that occur, you know, expected and unexpected and things that were avoidable and things that were not avoidable at first but are avoidable now. And, you know, we bump into this stuff. When, when somebody finds himself in... A situation where illness suddenly strikes them and they're in the hospital for weeks or maybe not in the hospital for weeks but recovering for weeks or months you know that can that's consuming there's things that can occur in your life that take over that take over to the extent that we can avoid them we need to because we've already made a commitment the deal is done will we devote our lives to something else and then stand before him in our with our temple which is called by his name, and say we are delivered without any intention of changing our behavior. Uh, continue with the comparison here. Some things about God's correction. It can be mitigated if we correct the issue ourselves. There was nothing stopping these people in the temple from doing the right thing. The past 400, 500 years, at any time, they could have opened up Deuteronomy they could have opened up Jeremiah, they could have opened up Psalm 69 and understood what was expected of them. He is patient. Very, very patient. When we are corrected by God, it will be upsetting. It's supposed to upset us. This idea of upsetting as in, as in we, we, you've upset the cart, you've upset the table. right? You, the, this thing that I was used to doing, I've been sitting here for a generation or more, charging people to exchange their money, selling things in the temple when I'm not supposed to be selling them. I've been doing this forever. And then some guy comes along and messes it all up. That's upsetting. You've upset it. It's supposed to upset us. The correction to the situation may be immediate, even if our attitudes don't immediately change. And, and, and to illustrate this may be easier than to just say it. When Jesus drives the animals out of the temple, does that solve the animals in the temple problem? It, it, in a way it does. But does it solve their attitude problem? It does not. And I, I can think of times where I have not affected change to the situation because I knew it wouldn't change a person's attitude. But when I look at this, I think that maybe there are times. Now, should I sit there and say, hey, I'm, I'm knocking over tables and Jesus did it too? I, I'm going to suggest a moment that approach might not be stellar. But, but when there's an opportunity to correct sin, even if the people around me don't like it, here's one example where it happened. And I need to consider that. And again, it shouldn't be unexpected. He has told us more than once that he doesn't like his temple corrected. And, and he's illustrated the pain that that caused him, caused him in the Psalms. And he's shown us his attitude toward that. And he has illustrated what should be done about it. That, that a purge needs to happen. So our response, unlike those in the temple, should not challenge his authority. What right do you have to come in here and mess it up for me? He's God. I don't know what to add to that. And it should result, it should result in immediate change. But this can be difficult. Okay? It didn't result in immediate change so far as I can tell. You know, it doesn't single anybody out as having changed between John 2 and Matthew 21. They're still doing it. They're still doing it. They're still corrupting the temple when they when they should not have been any longer. No excuses out there. I will be done in just a moment. This picks up a little bit on, on what I began with. The caution is this. Our pet peeves do not equal God's zeal for his house. Our aggressive combat with others' failures does not equal Christ's cleansing. And what I mean by that is this. Christ, Christ was perfect. We agree Christ was perfect. Okay. 
and we are to emulate him. But he has a grasp of, uh, he has control <laughs> uh, that we do not necessarily have. He has perfect knowledge. Okay? When I'm discussing a disagreement with somebody else, I, there's, a, there's a chance out there that I could be wrong. We're supposed to use scripture to determine what the truth is. But there's something I might be missing. Christ did not have that problem. He had perfect knowledge. He had perfect knowledge of the use of the temple. Right? He had perfect control as well. He, he's, he's not a person prone to lash. Well, he, he, he was a person like you and I, but he did not lash out like I do. Have, right? So, we may be correct. Your temple shouldn't be used that way. But we hardly have a right to claim righteous anger, right? Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 5. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay. We are fallible. We are hypocritical. We can be wrong. We can be wrong. Christ was right. He knew he was right. Now, with his perfect control, can we say, well, Christ, who had perfect control and perfect knowledge, behaved in a way that I have interpreted as anger, not just any anger, but like regular, you know, somewhat human anger, because he had a right to be, right to be angry over this thing, and then start flipping over tables and... and and, and, I don't know, they kind of stop flipping over tables. Nobody illustrates it as driving out the oxen. I don't know why. Um, but that's, that's the way it is. They're flipping over tables. They're, they're upsetting the money changers' tables. We need to be careful because we can corrupt our temple. When you're flipping over tables, you're flipping over tables from a temple that has been corrupted itself. Okay. And at the very least, caution. Humility would, would be helpful here because if you can identify that the other person is wrong that attitude would be hypocritical because you've been there too you've been there too so I would, I would suggest that if somebody is saying to you well we'll calm down and this is your response and I think of anybody in this room that would probably be somebody saying that to me um, nobody to pick on here myself um, we need to be careful but another danger of just saying oh well, Jesus flipped over temples and my lesson here is that I can do it flipped over tables and my lesson is that I can do it too is this. There's personal application here that you are responsible for your temple. The beam in your brother's eye is only your problem to the extent that you are able to help him in a loving way. After that it is up to him. We have far more responsibility for our own. For our own temple. And our body is a temple. So let the lesson be glorify God in your body. We know how Christ, Christ treated the temple. We know this. We know what happened when the temple was corrupted. We have our temples. Let's not corrupt them. That's the lesson I got from that. And that's all I have. I hope it's been encouraging. I hope it's been accurate. Um, here we are working with temporary um, bodies that God has given to us for a little while. And then they are gone. But the spirit is eternal. We are here because we're concerned about each other's spirits. And so if there's a specific need that you have that we can assist you in, now's as good a time as any to mention it uh, while we stand and sing the song that's been chosen. <coughs>